Hey everybody, and welcome to part four of the show with no names, Let's Read of the Westing Game. Chapter 10, The Long Party. I hope we're not too early. Grace Windsor Wexler always arrived at parties fashionably late, but not tonight. She didn't want to miss a thing, or a clue, or wait around in her apartment with a murderer on the loose. I don't think you can meet my husband, Dr. Wexler. Call me Jake. Hello, Jake, Judge Ford said. A firm handshake, laugh lines around his eyes. He needed a sense of humor with that social climbing wife. What a lovely living room, so practically furnished, Grace commented. Our apartments are identical in layout, but mine looks so different. You must come see what I've done with it. I'm a decorator, you know. Three bedrooms do seem rather spacious for a single woman. What does she mean, three bedrooms? This is a one-bedroom apartment. Wait, they they established multiple times that it's in a that they put turtle in the closet. It is like is something like, where is Angela staying? Is she staying, like, on the couch? Because one of them, because, nah, you know what? Probably that Grace Windsor Wexler is just an idiot and assumed stuff. It's probably that. What is she? Would you care for an appetizer, Mrs. Wexler? I'm curious to know exactly how you are related to the Westing family. The judge had hoped to take the heiress by surprise, but Grace gained time by coughing. Goodness, that ginger spicy. It's the Szechuan cooking style, you know. How am I related? Let's see. Uncle Sam is my father's oldest brother, or was he the youngest brother of my grandfather? Excuse me, I need to greet my other guests. The judge left the paddling part pretender. Father's brother or grandfather's brother, if the relationship was on the paternal side, her maiden name would be Westing. So the party went on and on. No one dared to be the first to leave. Safety numbers, especially with the judge there. So the guests ate and drank and jabbered and... They watched the other guests eat and drink and jabber. No one laughed. I guess murder isn't very funny, Jake Wexler said. Neither is money, Mr. Who replied glumly. Deciding that his wife had found the perfect partner, the podiatrist moved on to the, t to the two women standing in silence in the front window. Cheer up, Angie Pie. You'll see your den soon enough. His left daughter twisted out of his embrace. Are you all right, Angela? I'm fine. She was not fine. Why did they ask about den all the time, as though she was nobody without him? Oh, well, it wasn't just that. It wasn't even the humiliation of her mother chiding her about the twin costume in front of everybody and sending her back to the apartment to change clothes. It was more than that. It was everything. Okay, we got one daughter that's being un that's being completely pooped on by the mother, and the other one who's never taken seriously, treated as though she's just an object. I think we've met one of the worst mothers ever. Oh, and yeah, yeah, one of the worst mothers ever, because she needs to do double work because the dad is out all the time. Jake turned to Madam Who. Hi there, partner. She doesn't speak English, Dad, Angela said politely. And she never will, Angela, if no one talks to her. Snow, said Madam Who. Jake followed her pointing finger. That's right, snow. Lots of snow. Snow, trees, road, lake, Michigan. China, said Madam Who. China? Sure, why not, Jake replied. China. Angela left the chatting couple. Why couldn't she have made some sort of friendly gesture? Because she might have been a wrong, done the wrong thing and annoy her mother. Angela, the obedient daughter, did only what her mother told her to do. Hello, Angela. One of these tidbits might cheer you up. Judge Ford held the tray before her. I hear you'll be getting married soon. Some people have all the luck, Sadell Pulaski said, appearing from nowhere to lean over the tray to fear a cube of pork. Of course, not all of us women have opted for marriage, right, Judge Ford? Some of us prefer the professional life. Though I must say, if a handsome young doctor like Denton Deer proposed to me, I just might change my mind. Too bad he doesn't happen to be twins. Excuse me. Judge moved away. Yes, subtle, Sadell Pulaski. I'm not having any luck at all, Angela, Sadell went. If only your mother hadn't made you change clothes, I mean, surely would have mentioned twin. It's harder to judge reactions when I have to bring up the subject myself. You shouldn't let your mother boss you around like that. You're a grown woman, and you're going to get married soon. Excuse me, Angela moved away. Yes, I would like a refill, Sidel said to nobody and hobbled to the bar. Something non-alcoholic, please. Doctor's order. Make it a double. Twins. Subtle! Twins? What's she talking about? Theo wondered, staring at the black and white checkered costume. Two ginger ales for the chessboard coming right up. Too subtle! In among her guests, the judge studied the two people standing off in the corner, the only pair of Sunset Towers residents that were not Westing heirs. Yeah, those parents totally got screwed over. They could have been part of the inheritance. 
Why does Westing hate the Theodorakis parents so much? George Theodorakis placed his hand on the shoulder of his invalid son, a large, bronze, hard-working hand, like Theo. Theo resembled him in many ways. Tall, wide shoulders, slim-waisted, same thick, straight black hair, but age had chiseled the father's face into sharper planes. His troubled eyes stared across the room at Angela. Catherine Theodorakis, a slight, careworn woman, gazed down on her younger son with tired, dark-circled eyes. From his wheelchair, Chris watched legs. Other than the funny lady with the shorthand notes, the only glimpers were his brother Theo, Turtle kicked him again, and Mrs. Wexler, stood on one leg rubbing her stocking foot against her calf. A high-heeled suit stood alone in the carpet beneath her. Judge Ward didn't limp. Besides, she couldn't be a murderer, despite her clues. Nobody here looks that like a murderer. They're all nice people, even this fat Chinese man who grumbles all the time. George Theodorakis greeted Mr. Who with, How's business? Who spun around and stomped off from his fellow restaurant owner in a huff of anger. Yeah, how dare you have success, you know, Mr. Coffee Shop Man. I hate you. Joe, James Who, inventor, that's who the judge wanted to talk to. But there was a problem at the bar. A long line had formed, and it wasn't moving. There are 16 white pieces and 16 black pieces in chess, Theo was explaining to Sidel Pulaski. Do you play chess, Judge Ford? Okay, seriously, you've been talking to Sidel Pulaski about chess for like, Ten minutes at this point? Really? Priorities. You have a whole meeting to talk about this tomorrow. Don't do it now. It's a party. A bit, but I haven't played in years. The judge led the secretary away from the crowded bar. They almost think the West game has something to do with chess. He may be right. It certainly is as complicated as a chess game. But I did study, Doug was arguing. The judge interrupted. I haven't had a chance to thank you for the delicious food, Mr. Hill. How long have you been running in the restaurant business? Running up and down stairs is not studying, who said. Sidel Pulaski butted in. Father and son, you look more like twins. You're more equal partners to that Theodorakis kid, who continued. Why didn't you, why didn't you insist on holding the meeting in a restaurant instead of that greasy coffee shop? Because some people don't like chow mein for breakfast, Sidel Pulaski replied. All right, it's come to this point where they're just talking to no one and nobody's listening to each other. That's how most parties end up. There you are, dear. Grace patted a stray wisp of Angela's hair into place. You must do something about your quaff. I'll make an appointment for you with my hairdresser who wants to snow clear. Long hair is too youthful for a woman about to get married. I can't understand what's gotten into you, Angela. Coming to this party in that old checkered dress with those awful accessories just because your partner dresses like a freak. Wow. Wow. That's, like, awful. She's not a freak, mother. I was just speaking to Mr. Who about catering the wedding shower on Saturday. I arranged little madam I arranged for little madam who to serve in one of those slinky Chinese gowns. Where are you going? Angela Okay. She has to be the villain. There is nobody she has to be the murderer. Cause there is nobody else in this entire story who is as reprehensible as Grace Winsor Wexler. And Angela rushed into Judge Ford's kitchen. She had to get away. She had to be alone, by herself, or she would burst out crying. She wasn't alone. Crow was there. The two women stared at each other in surprise, then turned away. Poor baby. Crow wanted to reach out to the pretty child. She wanted to take her in her arms and say, poor, poor baby, go ahead and cry. But she couldn't. All she could say was, here. Angela took the dish towel from the cleaning woman and bunched it against her face to muffle the wrenching sobs. The guest jabbed on about the weather, about food, about football, chess, twins. Turtle was slumped on the couch, scornful of dumb grown-up party. You'd think one of them would know something about the stock market. She missed Sandy. Sandy was the only one in this dumb building she could talk to. Remember that quotation, May God they gold refine? Floor bomb by gas. Let's take a poll. I'll bet ten cents from the Bible. Shakespeare, Turtle argued. And make it ten dollars. Oh my. Well, all right, ten dollars. Together they made the rounds. Four votes for the Bible, three for Shakespeare, and one absentation. Madam Who did not understand the question. So Del Pulaski voted for the Bobsy twins. And how do you know those words were in the will? She asked suspiciously. Too suspiciously. So that's what lost important business papers meant. Oh yeah, because nobody was being able to guess. Yeah, that... Wow. Obvious and obliviousness. This is a wonderful crowd of people. Somebody stole the shorthand nose. Turtle smiled at the delicious na delicious nastiness of it all. I remember, that's all. If you remember so well, tell me what comes before that, Sidel challenged. I don't know what. The secretary had an audience now. 
I don't mind telling you, but not if you ask like that. Theo said, please, not turtle. Sadell leaned toward him with what could have been a gracious manner, but she grimaced when the top of her crotch poked her in the chest. The exact quotation, she announced loudly, hoping she was right, was, Just spend it wisely and make God thy gold refine. Right or wrong, her guess was received with groans of disappointment. The heir had expected m more, a hint, a clue, or something. But they didn't, and now it was time to go home. Chapter 11. The Meeting a pale sun rose in the third snowbound morning. Lake Michigan lay calm, violet, now blue. The tenants of Sunset Towers were waking, turning to a different view. Lured by the Westinghouse, they stood at their side window, scoffing at the danger, daring to dream. Should they or shouldn't they share their clues? Well, they go to the meeting in the coffee shop just to see what the others intended to do. Waiting in the closet of her room, Turtle stared at the white weighted branches of the maple on the hill. A twig snapped in silence, a flurry speckled on the crusted snow. Sometimes when her mother was too busy to do her hair, she sent Angela in, but today, no one came. They'd forgotten about her. Brush and comb clenched in her fists like weapons, she stormed into apartment 2C. Do you know how to braid hair? Flora Baumbach's pudgy fingers, flipped with the needle, were clumsy with the comb. After several tangled attempts, she managed to end up with three equal strands. My, with the care you have. I tried braiding my daughter's hair once, but it was too fine, soft and wispy like a baby's, even in her teens. That was the last thing Turtle wanted to hear. Was she pretty, your daughter? All mothers think their children are beautiful. Rosalie was an exceptional child, they said, but she was the lovingest person there ever was. My mother doesn't think I'm beautiful. Of course she does. My mother said I looked just like a turtle when I was a baby, sticking my head out of the blanket. I still look like a turtle, I guess, but I don't care. Where's your daughter now? Gone. Flora Baumbach cleared the catch in her throat. There, that braid should hold for the rest of the day. By the way, you never told me your real name. Alice, her replied, swinging her braid before the mirror. Not a single hair escaped its tight bind. Mrs. Bombeck would make a good braid if only she stopped yakking about her exceptional child. Rosalie, what a dumb name. You better get to the meeting now. Remember, don't say a word to anybody about anything. Just listen. All right, Alice, I promise. Theo wheeled his brother into the elevator and read the new message on the wall. $25 reward for the return of a gold railroad watch inscribed to Ezra Ford in appreciation of 30 years service to the Milwaukee Road. J.J. Ford, apartment 4D. F -f 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 Chris said. That's right, Judge Ford. Must be your father's watch. Probably lost it. Ezra sounds like a girl's name. Is it? Probably lost it. I don't think it could have been stolen by anybody at the party last night. Chris smiled. Her brother had not understood him. Good. This might be an important discovery. Judge Ford's name was the same as her apartment number. Ford, 4D. Why is that important? Who cares? How would that matter? Whatever. Theo led the waiting tenants through the kitchen where Mr. and Mrs. Theodorakis handed out cups of tea and coffee. Sorry, we're out of cream and lemons. Please help yourself to some homemade pastries. Walking to the coffee shop is like entering a cave. A wall of snow pressed against the plate glass window, sealing the front door that once opened to the parking lot. I got a car buried out there, Grace Wexler said, slipping into a booth opposite her partner. I hope I find it before the snow plows do. They ever get here, Mr. Who replied. Good thing this meeting wasn't held in my restaurant. I go broke passing out free tea, if you call this tea. He held up a tea bag with contempt and groaned on seeing his sweat-suited son jog in with a sweet roll between his teeth, bolt over his hands onto a stool. Where's your daughter the turtle? Mr. Exeter looks around. I don't know, maybe she's helping the father with the bookkeeping. Bookkeeping? Mr. Who laughed. Grace had no idea what was so funny, but she joined with him anyway. Nothing stirred people's envy more than a private joke. Yeah, and nothing stirs people's annoyance more than a private joke either. Thinking she was being laughed at, Sadell Pulaski dropped her polka dot crutch and spilled her coffee on Angela's tapestry bag before maintaining a solid perch on the counter stool. Clink, clink. Theo tapped the spoon against the glass for attention. Thank you for coming. When the meeting is over, you're all welcome to stay for a chess tournament. Stop it with the chess! Who cares? Meanwhile, I'd like to explain why my partner and I called this meeting. I don't know about your clues, but ours don't make any sense. The air stared at him with blank faces. No one nodded. No one blinked. Now then, if no two sets of clues are alike, as the will says, that would mean that each set of clues is only part of one message. The more clues we put together the better chance we have of finding the murderer and winning the game. Of course, inheritance will be divided into equal stairs. Sadal Pulaski raised her hand like a schoolbook. 
Well, about the clues that are in the will itself. Yes, we'd appreciate having a copy of the will, Miss Pulaski, Theo replied. Well, equal shares doesn't seem quite fair since I'm the only one here who thought of taking notes. Sadell turned to the group. One pencil eyebrow arched high over red sequin spectacles. Her self-congratulatory pose was too much for Mr. Who. Grunting loudly, he squeezed out of the booth and slapped the shorthand pad on the counter. Thief! The secretary shrieked, nearly toppling off the stool as she grabbed her notebook. Thief! I did not steal your notebook, the indignant Who explained. I found it on a table in my restaurant this morning. You can believe me or not, I really don't care. Because those notes you so selfishly dangled under our noses are completely worthless. My partner knows shorthands, and she says your shorthand is nothing but senseless scrawls. Gibberish. Pure gibberish, Grace Waxel added. Those are standard shorthand symbols, all right, but they don't translate into words. Thief! said all cried, now accusing Mrs. Wexler. Thief! Larcenist! Felon! Don't, Sidel, Angela said softly, her eyes set on the D she was embroidering. You wouldn't understand, Angela. You don't know what it's like to be... Her voice broke. She paused and lashed out at her enemies. All of them. Who cares a fig about Sidel Pulaski? Nobody, that's who. I'm no fool, you know. I knew I couldn't trust any one of you. You can't read my shorthand because I wrote in Polish. Polish? When the meeting was called again to order, Mr. Who suggested they offer Miss Pulaski a slightly larger share of the inheritance in exchange for a transcript of the will in English. However, I repeat, neither my partner or I stole the notes. And if anybody suspects us of murder, forget it. We both have airtight alibis. Doug almost choked on a sweet roll. If it got around to alibis, they'd find out that he where he was on the night of the murder on the Westinghouse lawn. Mr. Who went on, and to prove our innocence, my partner and I have agreed to share our clues. One minute, Mr. Who, Judge Ford stood. It was time for her to speak before matters got out of hand. Let me remind you, all of you, that a person is innocent until proven guilty. We're free to choose whether or not to share our clues without any implication of guilt. I suggest we postpone any decision until we have given the matter careful thought and wait until the time when all the heirs can attend. However, since we are assembled, I have a question to ask of the group. Perhaps the others do, too. They all did. Weary of giving away game plans, the heirs decided the question should be written out, but no names were to be signed. Doug collected the scraps of paper and handed them to Theo. Is anyone here a twin? He read. No one answered. What is Turtle's real name? Doug, who was playing another nasty sign. Tabitha Ruth, replied Grace, Mrs. Wexler, with a bewildered look at Flora Baumbach, who said Alice. Well, which is it? Tabitha Ruth Wexler. I should know. I'm her mother. You named her Tabitha Ruth? I don't even think that was a normal name in the 70s. Doug, Doug changed his mind about the sign. He didn't spell Tabitha Ruth. Tabitha Ruth is spelled exactly how it sounds. So, Doug's just kind of an idiot. The unfolded the next question. How many here have actually met Sam Westing? Grace Wexler raised her hand, lowered it, raised it halfway, then lowered it again torn between her claim as Sam Westing's relative and being accused of murder. Mr. Who, an honest man, held up his hand and kept it up. His was the only one. Judge Ford did not find it necessary to respond to her own question. Theo recognized the scrawling handwriting of the next question. Who got kicked last week? Chris did not receive an answer. The meeting was adjourned due to panic. Chapter 12. The First Bomb Ooh, we're finally getting started with the bomber. It was so sudden, the ear splitting bangs, the screams, the confusion. Theo and Doug ran into the kitchen. Mrs. Theodorakis ran out. Her hair, her face, her apron were splattered with dark, dripping red. Blood! Sadal Pulaski cried, clutching at her heart. Don't just sit there! Catherine Theodorakis shouted. Somebody call the fire department! Angela hurried to the payphone on the wall and stood there trembling, not knowing whether to call or not. They were snowbound, and the fire engines couldn't reach Sunset Towers. Theo leaned through the kitchen doorway. Everything's fine. There's no fire. Chris, honey, it's all right, Mrs. Theodoraka said, kneeling before the wheelchair. It's all right. Chris, look, it's just tomato sauce. Tomato sauce? Mrs. Theodoraka was covered in tomato sauce, not blood. Curious hair is now piled in the ki kitchen, except for Sidel Blasky, who slumped to the counter. She could have a heart attack, and none of them would notice. Mr. Who surveyed the scene, trying to conceal his delight. What a mess, he said. That row of cans must have exploded from the heat of the stove. The entire kitchen was splattered in tomato sauce and soaked in foam from the fire extinguishers. What a mess. George Theodorakis regarded him with suspicion. It was a bomb. Catherine Theodorakis thought so too. 
There was hissing, then bang, bang, sparks flying all over the kitchen. Purple sparks, red sparks. Cans of tomato sauce exploded, Doug Hughes said, defending his father. The other agrees. Mrs. Theodorakis was understandably hysterical. A bomb? Ridiculous. Sam Wessing certainly did not appear to have been killed by a bomb. Judge Ford suggested that the accident be reported to police immediately in order to collect on the insurance. We might as well redecorate the entire kitchen, Grace Wexler, the decorator, proposed. It should be functional yet attractive. With lots of copper pots hanging from the ceiling. Their kitchen is destroyed, Grace. Stop making it about you. I don't think there's any real damage, Catherine Theodorak replied, but we'll have to close for a few days to clean up. Mr. Who smiled. Angela offered to help. Angela, dear, you have a fitting this afternoon, Grace reminded her. We have so much to do for the wedding shower this Saturday. In thumped Zidel Pulaski. I'm fine now, just a bit woozy. Goodness, what a nasty turn. Having recovered from the nasty turn, Zidel Pulaski settled down, transcribing her shorthand to Polish, then from Polish to English. Startled by loud banging on her apartment door, she struck the wrong typewriter key. Open up! Recognizing the voice, Angela unbolted the door to a furious turtle. All right, Angela, where is it? What? The newspaper you took from my desk. Angela carefully dug through the embroidery, personal items, and other paraphernalia into the tapestry bag and pulled out the newspaper folded to the Westing obituary. I'm sorry, Terrell. I would have asked for it, but you weren't around. You also don't happen to have my Mickey Mouse clock in there, too, do you? Turtle softened on seeing her sister's hurt expression. I'm only kidding. You left your engagement ring on the sink again. Better go get it before someone steals that, too. I wouldn't worry about anyone stealing Angela's ring, Sidelplowski remarked. No mother would stoop that low. The thought of Grace being the burglar was so funny to Turtle, she plopped down on the sofa and rolled about in laughter. It felt good to laugh. The stock market had fallen five points today. Angela, please tell your sister to get her dirty shoes off my couch. Tell her to sit up and act like a lady. Turtle rose with a tongue click, very much like her mother's, but she was not about to leave without striking back. Arms folded, she leaned against the wall and let them have it. Mom thinks Angela was the one who stole the shorthand notebook. That got them. Look at those open mouths. Because my mom asked to see it, and Angela does everything that she says. Anyone could have stolen my notebook. I didn't double lock my door that day. If Zidell couldn't trust her own partner, she was alone. All alone. Did mom really say that? Angela asked. No, but I know how she thinks. I know what everyone thinks. Grown-ups are so obvious. Ridiculous, scoffed Zidell. For instance, I know that Angela doesn't want to marry that sappy intern. Ridiculous. You're just jealous of your sister. Maybe, Turtle admitted, but I am what I am. I don't need a crutch to get attention. Uh-oh, she's gone too far. Turtle didn't mean it that way, Sidel, Angela said quickly. She used the word crutch as a symbol. You mean, you know, as some people are so afraid of revealing their true self, they have to hide behind some sort of prop. Oh, really? Sidel replied. Then Turtle's crutch is her big mouth. No, Angela thought carrying her sister out of the door and back to the apartment. Turtle's crutches are braid. The newspaper man called again to say he had found some photographs taken at Westingtown, par at Westingtown parties 20 years ago. One of those names appears in the caption of Violet Westing's, Violet Westing's escort, George Theodorakis. Go on, that's all. He promised to send her the clippings in the Westing file as soon as he was shoveled out. Judge now knew four of the heirs of Westing connections. Mr. Who, the inventor, Theo's father, her partner, Theo's father, her partner, Sandy McSuthers, who had been fired from the Westing paper mill, and herself. But she had to learn more, much more about each one of the heirs as she had hoped to protect the victim of Sam Westing's revenge. She would have to hire a detective, a very private detective, who had not been associated with her in any practice or in the courts. J.J. Ford flipped through the yellow pages to investigators, private. Good grief! Her fingers stopped at the top of the list. Stopped near the top of the list. Was it a coincidence or dumb luck? Or was she playing right into Sam Westing's hand? No choice. She had but to chance it. The judge dialed the number and tapped her foot impatiently, waiting for an answer. Hello, if you're looking for a snowbound private investigator, you've got the right number. Yes, she had the right number. It may be a trick, but it was not a coincidence. The voices were one and the same. Ooh, somebody is doing something. So, who set us up the bomb? Who murdered Sam Westing? Who was the burglar? Will someone kill Grace Wexler? Find out on the next part of the Let's Read of the Westing Game.